You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. So be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike, options pricing and analysis software. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. Visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for TWIFO. This week in Futures Options, the program where the name says it all. We break down the week that was and indeed still is on the Futures Options side of the fence. Maybe we'll talk some rates. Maybe we'll talk some ags, some metals, some energy, some equities. You never know what's going to make it onto the old tape. Last week we talked some dairy, huh? Go figure. You never know what's going to make it onto the tape. That's why you got to tune in every week. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting the Options Insider Radio Network. Pleased once again to be joined here in studio for the live TWIFO broadcast by my FTSE Russell compatriot, Mr. Sean Smith, the Managing Director of Derivatives Licensing over there at FTSE Russell. Sean, welcome back to the program. Welcome back to the studio. You made it here. In the, what do we have, five feet of snow now? It's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, it's great to be here, Mark. Thanks for having me. It's always great to be on TWIFO. Um, uh, it's, it's just fantastic. I got to tell you, outside is just wrong. Uh, it's Halloween snow. You can't see as you're walking down the street. The the rent. It's the wet, sticky, heavy snow. It gets right in your eyes, and it's just uh, winter. We just need a little more autumn in this town. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. I'm not there yet. I'm not ready for like you know the Yule logs and all this winter. I, I'm not there at all yet. I need a nice. Uh, I was I was excited to go trick or treating. Halloween's like my big my big holiday, and you know here we are. Got to shovel our way out to get there. My little guy's got a he's got a, a sweet electric proton pack. He's a Ghostbuster. You can't carry that out in the middle of the snow. So yeah, not looking good here, Sean, for our for our prospects for trick or treating. But you know what else is going on this week? Also, probably you could argue dubious timing because they had it all the way through Halloween. Is of course the big futures industry association expo down here in Chicago. The entire derivatives world 
descends on Chicago. I mean, this is always the Mecca, but then this week it really becomes Mecca, particularly on the future side. You get firms and brokers and exchanges from Latin America, from Asia, from Europe, everywhere. It's kind of a who's who of the spaces down there. I, was, I took a little bit of a tour down it yesterday. I saw you down there, so I know, I know you were down there, Sean. So first off, what brought you down to FIA this year, and what did you think of the event? Did you find any interesting nuggets, any interesting conversations, any interesting pearls of wisdom come, come through your booth there, sir? You know, first, I just want to compliment Walt Lucan and company. Uh, the Futures Industry Association just does a fantastic job of bringing really relevant, uh, important information uh, that comes with all of our exchanges, our partners, our regulators. Um, it, it's just a fantastic show that he puts on, and it couldn't be better for the industry to get together like this a, a couple of times a year here in the States, and he does this in Europe and in Asia as well. He's got uh, uh, Futures Industry Association conferences, and the content globally is just fantastic and relative to what's going on in the marketplace. But there's been some great panels this week. Uh, the this, the uh, exchange leadership panel was fantastic. The clearinghouse, the CCP clearinghouse today was good. Uh, I think one of those hot topics was more skin in the game kind of discussion from CCPs. And I think our exchanges are are doing a fantastic job. CME's clearinghouse and OCC, they just do such a fantastic job of managing the risk. Um, you never hear that in the OA crisis that there was a problem in the Chicago clearinghouses, right? It was Yeah, everyone thinks, everyone thinks in 08 or even back to 87, right, that it all started in, like, you hear it, it started in the SPX pit or the OEX right. pit, right? But there never were any actual issues in the options. Everyone labels derivatives as these super crazy risky things, yet nothing happened here. It was all on the other side of the fence. Exactly. And just to, to, to get right into equities, uh, you know, uh, OCC and CME's clearinghouse has a cross-margining arrangement where if you're trading SIBO's Russell product, you could trade CME futures as a hedge and you get that margin offset. So it's a, it's a, a great relationship uh, here in Chicago, the center of the universe for derivatives. And uh, the, the conference was fantastic. Definitely this week. I'm, I'm curious, what was it that FTSE Russell was hawking? What wares were you promoting front and center down there? At, it's a futures show, so I'm assuming it was maybe the rut future. What was, what was front and center for you guys down there? Front and center for us is bringing uh, more awareness to Russell 2000, the index. We're really uh, uh, trying to uh, bring more eyes, more users uh, to trade Russell 2000 futures and options on both of our partner exchanges. So we had lots of discussions t- this week. And how did that go? So I saw you talking to a variety of personnel from across the globe. What, what's, what's the uptake been? What was the response to? Because I'm always fascinated what an international clientele thinks of domestic small cap stocks like the Russell 2000. So I saw you talking to a whole bunch of different international folks down there. What, what's the response been? It's uh, a domestic small cap stock index with a global reach. It's actually a, a great trading vehicle. People are finding tremendous opportunity. You know, 10 to 15% of Russell 2000 uh, mini futures and now micro futures trade uh, out of Europe. And as I think we've brought this up uh, several times on the show. And the, and, the, and the traction in Asia is growing as well. The reach uh, from SIBO and CME into these, these regions is, has just been getting better and better. And just you, you bring awareness. They put it on their screen. They look at the symbol, and all of a sudden they see, wow, this is volatile. Yeah, whoa, it's liquid. And they start trading, and they continue to trade. So these, these are really hot spots for both of our partner exchanges. I'm glad to hear that the international audience is resonating with, with, with the Russell 2000. And since we're talking equities, we could start there, or do you want to start somewhere else? You're let's, go our, you're, let's go equities? Okay, we, I, think, I, think, I think we can make that happen here. So first off, before we do that, let me do really quickly our, our top five, our top ten total, really, movers and shakers. For the week. I'll let you choose here, too, Sean. Do you want to go dark side or light side? Where should we start? Let's go light. You are quite the optimist. I like that. That's what I like about you, Sean. All right, let's go. Always. <laughs> full, always. <laughs> let's go to the upside first. Uh, our top five. Again, these are the big products moving over there and shaking over there on CME Group. You want to follow it along for yourself? CMEGroup.com slash TWIFO or TWIO, T-W-I-O. They both work. You can find either one there, CMEGroup.com uh, slash TWIFO or TWIO. We'll get you to what we're talking about right now. Let's start with, let's go to the top five. The bottom of the top five, feeder cattle. Don't say that one too often. Up about 2.4% this week. Number four, we were just talking dairy. Sean, dairy last week. All of a sudden, dairy is like the hot commodity out there, pun intended, out there. Uh, it's not, not a big option story, but it's fascinating to see uh, dairy lighting it up. and continues to light it up this week. Class 3 milk up nearly 5%, 4.85%. Number three, iron ore, one a lot of you have written in about before, asked us questions about. We've done deep dives into it. Problem is... 
doesn't really trade it from an options perspective. Uh, up 5.83% this week. Then Nat Gas. Nat Gas continues to boom and bust to the upside, to the downside. Having a boom week again this week. Up nearly about almost 8.5%, about 8.3%. And then Euro dollars off to the races this week, Mr. Sean. Up 14%, excuse me, 14% to the downside. We've got heating oil. Actually, anyway, that's, let's, let's reverse that. To the downside, we have number five, soybean oil. Up about 2.4%. Then we've got wheat off 2.6%, then WTI off nearly 3.7%, and then Brent followed hot on his heels by Brent about 3.9%, and then number one with a bullet to the downside is heating oil off about five and a quarter percent. So Mr. Sean, you said you want to start in rates. I think we can do that. Listeners, you can do that yourselves. I'm not sorry, not rates, equities. If you want to do uh, equities, pull that drop down there. You go to cmegroup.com slash trifo, grab that blue drop down, click on equity indexes, and then go to, let's start in Russell land, because Sean's sitting to my left here. We'll start in Russell 2000 land. I like to hit the, cl- the, the view all, but uh, to each their own. The, you pick your poison here when it comes to all things Russell 2000. Uh, let's see what we got here, Sean. We'll, let's start off here. I know you've been traveling. This week you were traveling domestically. But what's been, uh, what's been the hot button topic? What's been the thing, the clients, the end users, the market makers, whoever it is you're talking to out there, institutional users, what are they bringing up to you these days when they want to talk, you know, rut options and options out there? What are questions, concerns, issues, things they like? What are they seeing out there? Uh, they're seeing uh, the fact that uh, there's the first of all, Russell has seen a, a spike in volume in the last few weeks, which is right is really exciting to see in both on both exchanges. Um, I think that just due to the market conditions and some volatility in the market, and, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about small caps on the news. Um, if, if you've got CNBC on your uh, uh, on your big screen during the days you're watching the markets, uh, there's been just a lot of uh, exposure bringing up the Russell 2000 and small caps and uh, them not so much as outperforming the other indexes, uh, but the fact that they are uh, uh, a volatile a volatile gang of stocks. Uh, those 2000 stocks are uh, uh, showing some volatility. So I think that. It's healthy volatility and tradable volatility, which makes it fun for the market. I like that. I think you coined a new phrase, a volatile gang of stocks. I think we can run with that, Sean. I could, be, I could put out some releases. What do you think? We could uh, rena- <laughs> rechristen the Russell 2000, a volatile gang of stocks. What do you think? I think it's a great idea. I like it. That'll, that'll get some traction. Some folks will want to invest in a volatile gang of stocks. If you wanted that volatility out there in the Russell, you got it this week, listeners. The Russell coming in at the end of the week has kind of been a topsy-turvy week for the equities. Uh, we're back on the downside again towards the latter portion of the week. We're seeing continued concerns about the trade war, continuing to spook people out there. It seemed like maybe it was a done deal for a little bit, then not so much. The Fed feeding into that as well. We'll get to the Fed in a little bit when we talk uh, about rates here. So uh, all of the major indices were off coming into showtime. The Dow is actually leading the charge to the downside, off about three-quarters of a percent. Don't see that too often. Usually it's the NASDAQ. NASDAQ was the laggard, off about a third of a percent. S&P about two-thirds of a percent right in the middle there. And Russell coming into showtime actually is kind of uh, the laggard to the downside as well, only off about two-tenths of a percent here net on the week. That puts it down about five handles close to it. Uh, I've seen vol coming up there, of course, in the equity land. You sell off in the broad index, the vol is going to come up, and vol is up pretty strong in these front couple of the contracts. Both of these are going out pretty soon, pretty much today, tomorrow. Uh, so not a lot to be seen from a vol perspective. That's mostly gamma. Let's go out a couple of weeks. Let's go out to that Nov contract here, and vol up still pretty firm out there, about over a point, about 1.2 points. So again, Sean, back to your point. If you kind of wanted vol this week, Seems like uh, Vol never really went away that hard, and it stayed and is back again here. In fact, let's look at it again because last week we had a VIX at about uh, thirteen. We're at about thirteen thirty-five right now, so the VIX is up a little bit, about a third of a point. We're seeing the volatility of volatility, which is about eighty-six and a half. So that's almost exactly unched from where it was last week. So the Vol of Vol has kind of stayed constant. And our old friend RVX. This is kind of like the third or fourth week in a row, Sean. I'm saying this. Down, but pretty much effectively unched, not even a third of a point here. It's about a 1740, almost a 17 half. Mm -hmm. This is kind of interesting. This is the first time I think that I've been watching Russell Vol since you guys have been participating on the show for a while, certainly in the last month or so, where it seems like almost every other week I'm coming in here and saying net on the week, Russell Vol is unched. That's kind of interesting. Is that that surprising to you? Um, Actually, no. I'm as 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 I uh, have spoken many times about volatility. I'm I'm surprised it's not a little higher right now so but yeah uh, uh the the small caps are just naturally a, a more volatile index so yeah we're still hovering right around a 17 half out there in the rvx which is of course the vix 
of the Russell 2000. That puts that VIX RBX spread at a, a tick north of four, about 4.05. So effectively on from last week, slightly about 0.05 wider, really, from last week, but not a huge uh, change out there. Let's see what's lighting it up out here from a Russell 2000 options perspective. A bit of a change uh, from recent weeks. In fact, I think we have a listener question about this a little bit, so I won't get into the puts too much, but I don't have to worry about that this week because actually it seems like a little bit more than a third of the paper going up in de- on the call side of the ledge. This is the first time we've seen a lot of upside calls lighting it up. We're coming into showtime. We're at about a 15 double or so in the Russell 2000, and it's the 1,600 calls in Dece that are leading, leading the dance out here this week, which is kind of interesting. Sean, Another, th- actually, we have a listener question about this. Maybe we shouldn't go into it too much right now, but I'm, I'm going to touch on it anyway because it's kind of fun. We have talked about it before. It does seem like the trading pattern consistently out here with these rut options week after week is the largest prints are out there. Someone's playing, rolling, doing whatever they are, and pretty far out of the money and pretty far out in terms of time puts. And that's not the case this week. It's uh, it's upside calls, the 1600s uh, to be precise. Does does that surprise you, sir? That we're not back on the on the put parade this week. Not at all. Uh, so, you know, as as you get volatility in in Russell, the uh, the the calls are to, to write calls is actually a, a great strategy. And you know, there are there are those buy right index indices that are listed at SIBO as well. Uh, there's put right indices as well. So there's um, there's ways. Uh, there's a lot of attention on option volatility in Russell. Um, and uh, I'm not surprised at all. You know, risk reversals are a big trade. They like to sell calls uh, and buy downside puts uh, as a strategy. Um, so I'm, I'm not surprised at all. Not surprised at all. Save some not surprised for that listener question we have about that in a little bit there, uh, Sean. We got a lot to, to unpack here on the show. I know you're, old, you're always a rates guy. This is a rates week. Should we, should we dip our toes into rates next, sir? Let's go there. All right, let's do it. Let's go there, he said. Let's go to rates you too can go there, of course, listeners, seemegroup.com slash twifo, or you can come up with what our next one is, which has a listener question about this as well. Of course, you're talking rates this week. You got to talk Fed. Fed coming in pretty much doing what everybody expected here on, on the show and indeed <laughs> in the markets looking at the FedWatch tool. It was pricing in, oh, roughly 95%. Last time I checked it or so that the Fed was going to do pretty much exactly what it did, cut by a quarter of a basis point, and that's pretty much uh, where we got, or a quarter of a point, I should say. A quarter of a basis point would be pretty small. A quarter of a point, and uh, that's pretty much what we got out here this week. By the way, since we're talking Fed Watch, let me, let me pay off this question really quickly. This one comes from Neil. going to cheat and bump him up. He says, what is Fed Watch saying right now about the cut in Dece? Uh, listeners, you guys can find this for yourselves. We'll do it for Neil here, but in the future, you guys can do this yourselves. Just type in just type in CME and FedWatch. It'll get you right there. Even type FedWatch. It'll probably get you there as well. And you'll see what I'm seeing right now, which is the FedWatch tool. Our next meeting, if you're just counting the minutes until our next FOMC meeting, is in 40 days and 23 hours and 12 minutes, Sean. So, so mark it on your calendars. Get ready. We'll have a big party in here. And looking right now, people have talked a lot about how the Fed has kind of fired off all their bullets. This is the third cut they've had. Over the course of the past year, uh, so not a lot of ammo left, uh, arrows in the quiver. Choose, pick your metaphor, <laughs> we'll butcher it here on the show, but not a lot of ammunition left for the Fed, and looks like the market kind of agreeing at it right now. Neil and everybody else was wondering, the market's pricing in about a 75% probability they're going to stay right where they are. I'm actually surprised, Sean. They're saying 25% chance they may cut again by a quarter point. That seems fairly aggressive. I'm, I'm surprised it's that high. I thought it would be about a 6%. What do you think? You know, I'm not a I'm not a guy to to uh, speculate. the The Fed, I think, does a great job. So you're, you're an old school Euro dollars guy. You, yeah, you, you could weigh in a little bit. All right, you know, twenty five percent is still a, a pretty pretty strong probability. It is. Um, it is. Yeah, that that surprises me. I, I would have thought it would like sub ten, definitely. But that's not what we're seeing here, Neil and everybody else. So a little bit surprising. These numbers obviously are prone to change. We're right in the first blush as we approach that number and that announcement. This is going to obviously change. But let's get into uh, let's get into some of the paper out here. But yeah, I'm surprised here, Neil, that this is as high right now. I, I, four cuts. That would be a lot. <laughs> I don't know. At that point, what's left, Sean? What, what, what else can the Fed do? Yeah, exactly. They come knock on your door and say, "Here's ten thousand dollars for each of you." That's that's the next step. That's the next step for the Fed. Because yeah, at a certain point, they need to save some ammunition, listeners, in case things do turn south. In case housing market or the economy or inflation or the market they all start turning south, the Fed needs to have some ammunition for those. And right now, they don't really have any. We're cutting rates and we're markets at all time highs. So, an interesting, some may say, aberrant scenario. 
Uh, speaking of aberrant, Sean, it's, <laughs> there's no other word really to describe the paper that goes up out here in Eurodollars. Look at the Eurodollars right now. I was talking with someone about this at FIA this week. Just what a monster this product is. I mean, we talk about these other complexes. We'll talk energy. We'll talk gold and other things. And they'll do 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, maybe 100, some odd thousand contracts. Eurodollar is doing that in one option, not even the strike, just one call or one put on that strike. Like, let's look here right now. The front no put here in Eurodollars this week. Eurodollars should say, uh, looks like ever so slightly up, quite almost unched here on the week, hovering right, right around that 98, pretty much, and an eighth level. And that 98 even put listeners, actually, I take it back, 98 and three. 98 and 3 eighths put doing 243,000 contracts on the company call. 98 and 3 eighths call, Sean. 243,000 contracts just in that one call. You know, that's, I haven't done the quick math here, but I'd probably add it up. That's going to be the next four or five complexes we talk about in aggregate. That's going to exceed them. That's just one call, Sean. One strike. It's amazing. The liquidity in the euro dollar complex uh, is just amazing. It is almost almost mind numbing just the amount of paper that goes up here. Looking at the vol, vol's a mixed bag here as well. Front portion of that curve, which gets out into uh, no, which was one of the active contracts out here. And Dees, Dees was did about twenty, almost twenty one percent out here this week. This is this is this is the one where if you hit select all, buyer beware here because you see get a, I do that right now. It's it's a lot of data. I'm scrolling for days here, listeners. So maybe you want to go with the old synopsis on the euro dollars page to make your life a little easier. But if you look in here, you see Dees did almost 21% of the paper here this week. The vol off pretty hard out there as well. But you're, of course, obviously makes sense. Some event risk was obviously priced in. Vol off seven, nearly eight points in that Dees contract here, that front Dees contract for uh, 2019 for the euro dollars. So interesting stuff. Let's look at the skew here really quickly. Uh, the skew in euro dollars, not a huge mover, but this week it moved a little bit to the call side. The puts were kind of unched. Both about 9.3 to 9.1% cheap to the at the money, but the calls were where the action was. 10.4% rich last week. This week, 13.1. So the even more bid. Vol comes in, call getting a little bit of a lift out there, pretty aggressive lift out here. It makes sense with these 98 and 3 eighths dominating the tape. Nearly a quarter of a million contracts. You know, that's an entire day for a product like VIX on a day like today, Sean. They're doing it in one call strike here in the euro dollar. And VIX, VIX is not a low-volume product, and yet that's what we're seeing. Or in the S&P future options, pick your poison of a very liquid product. And uh, the euro dollar is lighting up. Really quickly here, another listener question, Sean. Listeners are, are peeking into the show here today. This comes from Ntil. He wants to know, he said, do you guys see the recent issue with the euro dollars quotes? Maybe this is what's driving some of the volume in the options lately. He's referring to an interesting story here. I think this was in the journal, listeners, entitled Futures Exchange Reigns in Runaway Trading Algos. And uh, this just came out a day or two ago. And it says, over the past month, the volume of data generated by activity in the CME euro dollars futures soared tenfold. This is according to CME's own statistics. Now, you drill in a little bit, and it's not. You might think, oh, the futures are lighting it up. That's obviously driving the options, but not so fast. It was actually quote traffic that spiked 10x, not the volume so much. That means people are really coming in, cancel replacing orders really quickly out there to the point where it's almost getting dangerous for the marketplace. It makes it hard to transact when, when something's flickering in that quickly uh, to the point where last week CME came in and announced new restrictions on cancel replace orders and that's that seemed specifically for euro dollars and that seems to uh, have tamped down there on on the traffic they're they're blaming this effectively Sean on two different firms whose algos effectively got into a loop and were outracing each other and as a result they uh, they continue to generate just massive amounts and they have a great chart in the article of about 10x quote traffic here versus the traditional thing. What's weird about this is that, you know, that stuff happens. It happens in all the products. Usually it's, it lasts for a couple of minutes, right? Maybe an hour or two if it's really crazy. This lasted for days, which is kind of interesting and a little bit of barren, particularly for a, uh, a product that does a lot of paper like this. Uh, so I think the short answer to your question here, who wrote that in um, until is no, that's not, that wasn't driving volume. That was just quote traffic. But still, interesting stuff, Sean, that a product like this, as liquid and as deep as it is, uh, could have such an issue going on, and that could last so long. Does that surprise you as well? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the CME's technology has just enhanced so much. And I say this because I used to work there. But uh, they've gotten really good at reducing the size of messages um, it, technolo- from a technological perspective. And I, I'm not an IT guy. But uh, I know that one. this is, has been 
uh, something that the CME has been improving on since markets started trading electronically. Um, I remember their very first million-dollar days or million-dollar contract days on Globex. Uh, it, that was a big deal, and that was a lot of traffic then. So now, you know, volumes just dwarf that. Um, so in order to do that, you got to have uh, clean pipes with uh, efficient messaging and. Um, I'm actually uh, surprised uh, to see that, but again, uh, the algorithms spinning around and hitting each other, creating this multiple of messaging, uh, I think is how you put it. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's really good that the CME has addressed this. Yeah, they dove in. Sometimes those things need to be reined in. It sounds like it was, and they did it. So, yeah, to answer your question there, until it doesn't seem like that was driving a lot of volume, but it was driving a lot of a lot of messaging, which if you know, you're looking at the space, you're trying to get something done out there, a flurry of cancel replays all over the place is kind of obscuring, actually. It actually could have been contrary to getting a lot of volume out there because all that noise is going to bury the signal a little bit, which makes it harder to trade out here. Should we hang our hats in, in energy next, Sean? That was lighting up the top five to the upside and the downside this week. Energy, let's go there. Yeah, let's absolutely. Go there. Let's go there. All right, let's go to energy here. Let's kick it off here with our old friend WTI. Rough week. WTI was in our movers and shakers, though not in the right direction here this week. Listen, WTI was number three at about 3.7%. Number two was Brent. Number one was heating oil off five and a quarter percent. We also had nat gas to the upside up 8.3%. So a crazy week on both sides of the tape here for WTI and for nat gas. Let's go to WTI here first. Uh, WTI coming into the week again. A lot of these concerns over the lingering trade war issues. People had been hoping that you know WTI would catch a lift uh, here, but now with the trade war maybe behind us, trade war is not behind us now, and so WTI taking another bit hit this week off. Coming into now this latter portion of the show here, off about four point six percent here on the week. That puts it at about two point six handles to the downside, shy of that fifty five level again, about fifty four oh seven coming into this part of the show here. So. Interesting week here for WTI. Vol up again out here, which is kind of interesting. Up pretty firm, too. Uh, up multiple points kind of across the term structure. So a little bit of bid for WTI Vol out here. The hot month out here, the hot contract was Dece with a little bit over half, 54.3%. So let's look, let's look at the skew out there and see how the skew is moving. We've been talking, remember, for a while, what's it going to take to get the calls bid? Maybe it was this week a little bit. Let's see. The puts were 4.1% bid to get the money this week. 2.9%, so the puts came in, and the calls were 1.2% cheap to the at-the-money. This week, they're 2.5% rich, so they got a little bit of a lift. You know, it's kind of interesting. Sean, this has been an ongoing narrative of us here for a while. In fact, last week, we had Mr. Rhodes here holding down the FTSE Russell hot seat on the show last week, talking a lot of equities. But we also did talk a lot of uh, energy and other things as well. And he mentioned, which has kind of been an interesting thing, you know, the calls in WTI cannot manage to sustain a bid. In fact, the one day you think it would have, right, the day when the Saudis got attacked, 5% of crude production wiped off the board. Uh, as, as Russell mentioned on the show, the, the bid for the calls lasted about half a day, Sean. That was about it. That's about as long as they got uh, before the market started crushing them again. Isn't, isn't that crazy? That's, uh, I'm, I didn't know that. So, yeah, uh, that, that's uh, pretty interesting. You think you could get at least 24 hours of something out of that, right? You know, a little bit of Sturm and Drang, things moving. But no, these calls can't catch a bid. And then maybe that's changing this week. The puts, or excuse me, the calls skew is uh, turning it up a little bit. Let's, let's see what was trading out here that may have driven that, Sean. Out here in D, looks like the number one trade overall. Remember, we're just talking euro dollars. Quarter of a million contracts in one call. <laughs> a little bit different beast here in WTI. WTI is active, but we're talking about 364,000 contracts. This week, pretty active. We're talking a couple of call strikes in euro dollars. Uh, let's see. There's 60 calls here. We're number one with a bullet here in Dece. Doing 11, almost 12,000 contracts. The big day was Monday, about 4,500. 3,300 yesterday, about 2,200 today. A decent chunk of that closing. So that isn't going to bid up the calls because they're closing out some calls. Unless, of course, they were short calls and they're bidding them up. That could be the case. Either way, though, uh, 60 calls leading the dance out here. Number one with a bullet. Also, pretty close, though. Pretty close. Hot on its heels were the 50 puts. So a nice, tight strangle slash risk reversal. Call it what you will. 50, 60 out there. Right around that at the money strike, which is near 55 right now. About 54 and change. Uh, talking about 11,500 of the 50 puts going up this week as well. 3,200 on Monday, 3,000 today, 2,700 on Tuesday, and about 2,500 on Wednesday. So a pretty even day, or I should say even week here for the puts. And a good chunk of that opening. So calls closing, Sean, puts opening here. Not exactly surprising when you see in WTI having another week where they continue to sell off. On top of the trade war demand, we also saw numbers coming out of the U.S. EIA saying crude inventory is increasing by 5.7 million barrels from last week. 
Inventory is now at about 439 million barrels. That's about 1% above the five-year average for this time of year. So you all know the other side of that equation, international demand, which is weak, and strong supply, <laughs> that combo, it's going to weigh on, on WTI. And that's exactly what it did here this week. Really quickly here, I want to look out at nat gas too, because nat gas was kind of bucking the trend, Sean, from an energy perspective. Everything else on the energy side was selling off and selling off hard this week. Nat gas almost leading the dance to the upside. It was up eight eight and a half percent. Let's see, eight point three percent here this week. It was the number two, only behind the Euro dollars, which were up fourteen percent this week. Uh Euro dollars, if you said many times, kind of its own beast. But Nat gas has been a fun story, Sean. It sells off, it sells off, it rallies, it sells off. It's been kind of a very turbulent one to watch. Now we're in the uh, we're in the rally mode here again. It seems like a lot of people are are holding out hope that there will be a very cold winter. I, you know what, Sean? Maybe the snowstorm today is what's driving that gas because this seems to be reinforcing that narrative that we're in for a, a pretty garbage winter here, Sean. Which is a go- obviously a bullish story for that gas. Well, we're using a lot of that gas with, in the, with the weather going on right now. That's for sure. Yes, some might say we're spewing a lot here in the studio <laughs> as, as we're talking here, sir. But yeah, all this. F- Freezing cold weather here on Halloween, and the prospect for more it seems to be what's driving uh, nat gas. It's been a crazy week here. Uh, we had a, a decline last week. Now we're looking at a this this article. I'm not sure when this came out. This they were saying they were looking at a 17 percent gain for the week. Obviously, I think that was yesterday. And right now, it's come off a little bit during showtime. It's just about shy of seven percent here on the week, uh, but still an interesting interesting movement. Earlier in the week, it was hitting the highest level. And one of the biggest movements we've seen since uh, January of 2014. So uh, hot times out here in Nat Gas. Again, a lot of people looking for this crazy, tumultuous, frozen winter here. <laughs> Which I got to say, I'm not a huge fan. I'm not ready for it, Sean. I'm not ready for a, a terrible winter. But you know, it does sound good because last year... They kind of cursed us. They jinxed us when they came out and said it's going to be a very mild winter. I know once they say that, we're in for a Chiberia, which is pretty much exactly what we got last year. Frozen tundra, minus 30 degrees. It was terrible. But, you know, they're saying it's bad this year, Sean, which might – I'm very contrarian when it comes to that stuff. So it might, might be a good sign for us. What do you think? That's why I carry an umbrella because it never rains when I carry it. It's, I only get crushed when I, when I don't have it with me. So, like yeah, that. the contrarian uh, uh, works sometimes, so hopefully it jinxes us uh, in a positive way. I'm down for a positive jinx. Halloween, this early data set, not encouraging, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how the rest of the of the season holds up here. Coming into showtime here, yeah, net gas up almost 7% right now here coming into the latter portion of the show. We're seeing the action here was in that D's contract, that D's 2019 contract. 56, almost 57% on a contract that's going out in about 25 days. Uh, let's see here. The vol up pretty strong out here, up nearly four points in that contract as well. Not surprising. Big moves are going to translate into some vol. Let's look at some skew here really quickly. The calls are kind of unched, which is weird for a product that had such a huge upside move this week. Uh, it was 6% bid last week, 6.1% bid this week. So the calls haven't really moved. The puts have uh, have gotten bid up a little bit, though. They were about almost 4% cheap. To the at-the-money this week, they are 2.1% cheap. Uh, to the at the money there. All right, now looking here at what's lighting it up out here from a, vol- a, a contract perspective, I should say. It's we said we're at about a two. Looks like a two two sixty five strike. Two point six five strike seems to be around at the money. It was actually two and a quarter puts that were dominating the tape this week, doing thirty thousand contracts out here in D S twenty nineteen listeners. Let's see what they were up to out here. The big day was actually today. About half of that twelve thousand. Going up today, so close to actually it was thirty thousand contracts, so not quite half, but pretty close to it. And then we had Tuesday, the other big day, with about ten thousand four hundred or so uh, on Tuesday, and about fifty eight hundred yesterday. And so much went up today. We don't know the net open interest, obviously, but a lot of that so far this week has been opening. So opening downside put paper here in Nat Gas. I don't want Nat Gas enough to know if that's. If that's traditional type paper, I'll have to get some Nat Gas guys on here to talk about what they say. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's probably not. I think the calls are where the action usually is on these types of moves. Uh, the calls were pretty active, though. The 27, almost 28,000 of the three calls, the three even calls. So that's about, and you know, that's getting closer to add the money than it was a little while ago, threatening the three now. Uh, we saw 10,000 going up on Monday, almost 10,000 even, 7,300 on Tuesday, 6,300 on Wednesday and about 4,300 today. Total of about 27, almost 28,000. And net opening pretty much as well, about 5,000 net openings. Opening upside 
opening on the put side, but ever so slightly uh, to the two and a quarter puts as well. Also, really quickly here, two even puts, a lot of puts. Maybe there was, maybe it looks like Tuesday, 10,000 each one else. So maybe there was a vertical. Maybe some two, two quarter, two even, maybe some roll downs, Sean, of some puts here. Because the OI, the volume is kind of lining up, except for today. We saw about 5,000 and change on both strikes on Wednesday and about 10,000 and change on Tuesday. So maybe some, that would be, otherwise, that would make more sense why the two and a quarter puts and the two even puts are lighting it up on a week when the Nat Gas is on fire to the upside. That'd make more sense. So let's, let's assume. I'll have to go out here and dig a little bit after the show. But let's, let's assume probably some two-quarter, two-even put spreads went up here this week, listeners. Because it seems like those, those OIs are lined up. 27,000 of the two puts going up this week as well. Those were the big day was actually Tuesday. Again, like the two and a quarter puts, 10,500 there. Net slightly closing there. So maybe taking a chance to roll up on the two puts up to the two and a quarter. Now, now the Nat gas is rallying. That could possibly be uh, interesting stuff here uh, nonetheless out here. In that gas, that gas on fire from a vol, from an underlying, from a skew perspective, everything lighting it up out here. It's it's a fun product, and it's Sean because week after week, you don't know what's going to do. Is it going to rally historically like it did this week? Is it going to sell off? It does seem like they're putting a lot of weight on this forecast for a very cold winter, which we all know what happens, Sean, when uh, when you put a lot of weight on prognostications, right? It it can never come back to bite you, right? <laughs> You're right. Yeah, exactly, right. All right, Sean, you're our guest. You get to choose where we hang our hats next. Should we go maybe to metals? Is another product that, that's lighting up your tape here this week? What, what should we talk about? Metals. I think we can do that, metals. All right, let's go here out to gold. Let's pull it up. Listeners, if you go to your drop down, uh, go to that little blue drop down there, click on metals, and let's go out to gold. Remember we were talking last week, listeners. I think we have a listener question about this too, so I won't get too much into this. You guys are, are all over us with the questions this week, which we love. Keep them coming. Uh, about the skew and the interesting findings that Eric from CME found when looking at option skew, particularly call skew, and how that impacts price action in the metals. Let's look what's going on here this week. Back north of that much ballyhooed, much watched 1500 strike listeners, gold at about a 15, 13 and a half coming into right now here, right in the middle of the show here. Uh, so we're up about half a percent, not a huge move out here in gold land. Uh, this puts us pretty much at our highest level. And about five weeks in terms of finishing well north of the 1500 strike again. Net on the week, we're up, looks like, yeah, not quite 10 handles, about eight, eight and a quarter handles out here. So that still puts us firmly north of the 1500 strike, which I know a lot of our gold bulls in our audience will be happy about. Let's see here. Deese was where the action was this week, doing about 40, 41% of the paper. So let's see what's going on out here from a vol perspective. Vol actually off a little bit, which if you know a lot about gold, it's been a bit up of late, but traditionally gold vol has kind of been stuck in the doldrums for quite a while and uh, given back a little bit of that even this week. So whatever little bid there was, <laughs> slowly eroding out here in gold land. On a skew perspective, we like the metals from a skew perspective. They always tend to move a little bit. Looking at the metals skew out here, the puts last week, 5.4%. Cheap to the at the money this week, they are even cheaper about eight points. It's coming in about three percentage points on the put side, getting cheaper. The calls were nine percent rich this week, nearly 13 percent, 12.9 percent. So, calls catching a bid this week, listeners. Uh, that's what's happening out here in Dees in gold, which is kind of interesting. Let's see what might have been driving that. The biggest print out here this week in gold land. Let's do a quick scan. Yeah, it looks like it was these Dees. 1,500 calls here, number one with the bullet, 7,000 contracts. That puts euro dollars in perspective again, doesn't it, Sean? We're talking 7,000 contracts for the most active thing in gold. And what, a quarter of a million yeah. in one strike, yeah. <laughs> quarter of a million on not even a strike. The puts, I'm sure, did a bunch too, and but it was puts, just, yeah. just, or the just, calls, the calls. just the calls. Just the calls for the quarter of a million contracts. And that's, that's almost, let's look really, really quickly. Let's look at the entire gold complex. Uh, yeah, almost a quarter of a million contracts in the entire complex this week, Sean. So that, that just puts the monster, the beast, the Leviathan, that is Euro dollars, into a little bit more perspective out here. Let's see. Number one with the bullet out here, 1,500 calls, 7,000 of these bad boys. Not surprising. People like that even number level in gold and in the metals. 1,500 is where the action was. The lion's share actually going up today, about half of that, almost 3,500 of that 7,000 going up today. 1,500 Monday and Tuesday and about 1,000 yesterday. So a lot, And actually slightly closing, but again, we don't know about today's paper out here. The number two are the 14 half puts, uh, also doing about almost actually a little over 6,000 here. The big day was yesterday, 4,000 of those uh, going up yesterday, and that was actually opening. So a little bit of uh, tumult out there. Of course, you have the Fed 
the Fed decision obviously weighs on rates, weighs on the markets. The markets have been tumultuous this week as well. So we've seen gold having some interesting moves. Some people piling in on the 14 half puts. So a pretty tight strangle slash risk reversal there as well. 14 half, 1500. Those are two strikes that you probably would expect make a lot of sense coming into the, the movements that we've seen out here this week. So 1500 calls. Maybe that's why the calls catching a bit out here this week in DC. In the metals here. All right, let's see. How are we looking for time? You know what, Sean? We've got a lot of good questions about products from the listeners. Should we, should we move on? Let, let the folks join us on the show here? I think it's a great idea. Let's, let's uh, hear from some listeners. All right, then. Without further ado, it is time for your Futures Options Feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody. Sean and I talking about steak here in the intro, making ourselves hungry as we're coming into your questions. It is, of course, the Futures Options Feedback section. Uh, let's start here. Let's um, – actually, Sean, you got them in front of you. Which question do you want to start? You get to pick where we go, sir. We got a lot of questions there's on a lot of different – There's a question from Beams on Russell 2000 puts. Why don't we uh... – <laughs> How did I know? How did I know you were going to start there? All right, we'll go, we'll go right to Beams. Uh, Mr. or Mrs. Beams asking, I think the long-term Russell 2000 put trader is a seller taking advantage of inflated put skew to generate higher premiums than comparable spy strikes. Your thoughts? Well, you know, I kind of alluded to this earlier, Mr. or Mrs. Beams. And you're right. This is not the week I was going to try to pull up some paper to be emblematic of this. But unfortunately, it's not, it's not the put week out here in Russell 2000. It's the call week for, uh, for whatever reason. But, uh, yeah, it is interesting to see. That has been kind of par for the course of late. When we see big prints out here in the, in the multiple thousands of contracts, chances are they are decent beyond, and they are, you know, 5 10 15% out of the money, maybe more. We saw some puts going up, I believe, like 13 60 recently, that kind of stuff. So, I don't know, Sean, you see this paper flow even more than I do. What do you have to say here for Beams? Do you think he, he or yeah, she is right? I think, yeah, I think Beams is referring to a couple weeks ago they did. There was a massive puts put trade in, in Russell 2000. And uh, I think he's referring to that transaction. But yeah, this is exactly what they do. They look to generate higher premiums because the, the skew in uh, Russell 2000 is uh, at, a, at a, a level where you can take advantage of those higher premiums um, in, in, in the index options. So it's mostly harvesting then you're seeing out there? There's not a lot of hedging? Well, there's the other side of that transaction, which is the hedge for someone, right? So I actually think that uh, you're f- these these uh, these hedgers are finding the the premium ho- volatility harvesters, and they're finding a, a point where they're both comfortable getting into a trade. Uh, yeah, so I think the customers are coming in. They could they could very well be uh, coming in looking to harvest a little bit of premium. They got obviously someone taking down the other side, liquidity provider, market maker, someone out there, maybe a desk taking down the big prints and uh, taking it for themselves. But you're right. I'll have to dig in a little bit more when we see some more of these prints go up and see exactly when and what they're up to, what the market maybe was, how they're kind of executing this. Maybe that might be a little homework for you, Sean, for next time you come in. Maybe we'll do a little research. What do you think? Beams is giving you some homework. What do you think? Thanks. Thanks for the homework, Beams. Uh, uh, looking forward to uh, looking at this. But again, I, I agree. I think there's uh, uh, – I, I've made this uh, expression several times on the show, but buy puts when you can, not what you have, when you have to. Um, so you have that now. Then there's so many trillions of dollars benchmarked to Russell, Russell 2000. Um, it just makes all the sense in the world that there's someone out there that needs some downside protection, and there's, there's a, a volatility trade for that as well. All right, let's see what else you guys have up your sleeves. Jake, a lot of creative handles today, Sean. Jake. Jake and oh, Beams was kind of interesting. <laughs> Jake. Jake wants to know, uh, why do products like dairy and iron ore that move quite a bit have such light 
or non-existent options volume. And, you know, this is another week. We're just talking about the – you're right again. Class 3 milk was up nearly 5% this week and iron ore up nearly 6% this week. So those are two products that you're right, particularly lately, have been trading – and yet, for whatever reason, they do not do a lot of options. We've talked iron ore before. It's just not really an options product. Dairy, we talked about it. Let's, actually, let's pull it up again this week. Let's just see. Maybe we can get some updated stats here. If you want to find the dairy for yourselves, listeners, you got to go into the ag drop down, then go to dairy. We're talking class three milk, so let's start there. Let's see if you have any paper. Actually, nearly 13,000 contracts this week. So that's not bad for a product that doesn't do traditionally a lot of options contracts and the reasons for that are, are many and very a lot of these are obviously have robust futures markets and that's where the liquidity has grown up and for whatever reason maybe there isn't a, a huge hedging need out there made demand there hasn't been a lot of demand for the options the liquidity providers haven't migrated there as a result so they're not maybe streaming a lot of uh, crazy aggressive tight quotes in that product because no one's out there trading it it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing you know sean you're out there listing new products all the time you, you can't just make something be a hot options product right it has to have demand there first. It's the old catch-22 of any product. You have to have volume to beget liquidity, but how do you get the liquidity without the volume, right? It's kind of the old thing that every new product has to deal with, right? Absolutely. And and complimentary of CME as well. They understand these markets. They understand their clients. They have a, a great commodities team that is out there talking to these traders that are trading this product. So they uh, totally understand this. And so th- I'm I'm not surprised. Uh, you know the dairy universe is much smaller than the than the financial interest rate universe, right? So, yeah, you know these are also esoteric products, like you mentioned, iron ore and dairy. I mean, if you don't if you don't follow those markets very closely, it's kind of hard to fire up your whatever your brokerage account of choice is. So I'm gonna sling some I'm gonna sling some iron ore today. It's not not the thing your proverbial grandmother from Iowa usually says, right? They may be lured to gold. They certainly can be lured to crude because they see those things quoted a lot. They can certainly be lured into the broad equities on the futures and futures options side because they like to trade there. And even maybe rates on a week like this when they see the Fed, that certainly is something that could resonate with a broad retail audience even in particular. Class 3 milk, iron ore, not so much. I wish I wish all these products slung a tongue on the options here. What was it, uh, Jake? But you know, I think that might be changing, though. For dairy, as it starts moving some more, we see more volatility out there. People are going to naturally be attracted to more. The liquidity providers are going to want to start streaming it more because and trading it more because there's more vol, and that will be get a little bit tighter markets. And people might start discovering it. We get these questions all the time. You know, people look at broad equity volatility, whether it's Russell or S and P, whatever it is, and they're saying, oh, you know, maybe it's a little quiet out there. The vol is a little low. Where else can I go that can find some vol? I'm not saying I'm at the point yet, Sean, where I'm going to recommend Class 3 milk. <laughs> that would probably be an irresponsible thing to do. But, you know, it's, it's certainly getting more on our radar these days, which is it's kind of fun to have a, a broad, diverse array of products to recommend out there to the audience, Sean. What do you think? Is there a Russell Milk Index coming soon? You know, there isn't. But, you know, we'll be out there talking <laughs> to our clients just as our exchange partners do. So um, you paused for a second. I thought maybe there was something coming there. I was like, "Oh wait, did, did I did I stumble across a uh, a a secret not to be revealed nugget yet of the <laughs> forthcoming Russell Dairy uh, Dairy Index?" But uh, yeah, we're with you, Jake. We want to see all these things trade. Class three milk, you'll be happy to know, is, is coming alive. Not so much on the iron ore yet, but hey, we shall see. Uh, Lily, Lily, Lily Ann Thal wants to know. What's the answer as to why weekly WTI options don't trade? This is, <laughs> this is like the ongoing question that has plagued us on this show since time immemorial, Sean. Since we first started the first episode of this show, however long ago it was, we kind of started talking about this. If you know, you'll probably see it if you pull up WTI again right now. Let's pull it up right here. You can find it for yourselves, listeners. Go to the energy drop down, then go to crude oil and WTI, and bam, you'll see it for yourselves. And you're right. This is a thing we've noticed a lot. I've talked to many different people about this subject. I've talked to folks in the various energy products on, at CME on their research, on their options side. We've talked about it with some of the traders out there, the vendors out there. And uh, it doesn't seem to want to play ball with me all of a sudden. We'll go, here we go. <laughs> Let's try it again. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And you're right. They don't trade. The weeklies, kind of non-standard outside the monthlies, don't tend to trade. And it, the interesting thing is people will trade short duration contracts in WTI. They will trade a monthly when it gets down to the final couple of days. They will keep trading. 
And right now, all of a sudden, it's not wanting to play ball with me at all here. So I can't illuminate this paper for you, but hopefully it'll, when you pull it up for yourselves, listeners, uh, you will see it out there. But you'll see this for yourselves if you watch this. The non-standard weekly contracts, those kind of just regular weekly contracts, will do a, a paltry amount of volume. Here we go. Let's see. Now we're reloading. Let's see if we can get it up here for you to ex- exemplify it for you this week. But in general, yeah, these non-standard weekly contracts don't do a lot of volume. But the monthlies, when they get down to a couple of days left, they will do a lot of contracts. And uh, it's a kind of a mystery. I think we've come down to I talked about this with Nick a lot of times here on the show. We've looked at how these things are disseminated. I think it comes down, Sean, what it really comes down to and to Lilianth and everybody else is there's, uh, the devil's in the details with these types of products. And it seems like the way these quotes are disseminated and listed and are available in a lot of the trading plan forms, it somehow obscures the weekly. So they're not as readily accessible as the regular monthlies. Because people will trade a monthly that has two days to go. That, that's a weekly at that point, right? That's, that's just a standard contract that has eroded down to its final couple of days. They will trade that. So they will. it's not a question of they won't trade near duration vol or gamma in crude oil. It's just a question of they won't do it in these non-standard kind of weekly contracts. And I think that, Sean, that probably speaks to, and again, you're a product guy, so maybe you can speak to this as well. But in general, it seems like there's something, some issue with the way the quotes are disseminated or displayed on places like an active trader or some brokers that makes it hard to get at the uh, the weeklies. Is that maybe your takeaway as well? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking it's probably not a bad idea to get one of the energy guys from CME Group in here, like Jeff White, their options specialist. He's, he's fantastic. So um, – Love to have uh, a, a more in-depth energy discussion would probably be a good thing. We have done that. We have done that with this about everybody. You know, I've talked about it with Derek, who's the overall options guy. I talked about right. it with Blue, who's the research guy. I think we have talked about it with Jeff White, I believe, in the past. And since this show started, I think we have. And uh, and it's one of those ones that every we've had. Every everybody we ask has a different answer, <laughs> which kind of makes it even more uh, mystifying as to why this is happening. But, um, yeah, it's interesting to see that that is the case. So they will trade it in the weekly duration, just not in the actual weekly contracts, which is – here we go. It's finally coming up for me. Listen, let's see if we can see it here. And, yeah, with these weekly contracts, we're seeing 366 of the 54 puts and these contracts going out tomorrow. So these are the weeklies, whereas the 60 calls in the standard DEES are going at doing 11, almost 12,000. So it's a, it's a very different beast uh, entirely out here. And looking at uh, how much of the paper here. Yeah, 54% of the paper was in the D's contract, 0.8% in the week two NOV, and 1.4% in the week one NOV. So it's just a, a funky thing about the way these things trade. I think it has something to do with the way the quotes are disseminated. All right, Sean, let's see. We got time for... Yeah, we can do one. This is kind of an epic one, but I think it refers to an epic report. So let's get to this one. This comes from uh, L. L. Tim. L. Tim. There you go. Spanish Tim. (laughs) He or she wants to know, do you guys buy that the metals only sell off when the calls are bid? Sean, this refers to an interesting report Russell and I talked about last week on the show from Eric Norland over there on the CME research team. It was entitled, Gold and Silver Options Are Pointing to a Pullback. And what he pointed out was kind of an interesting, somewhat counterintuitive observation that he noted that whenever the calls get extremely bid in both silver and gold, it's followed almost almost always by a pretty aggressive sell-off in the actual underline, which is, like I said, somewhat counterintuitive. You think the calls are bid, people are expecting the thing to rally. And uh, I, will, I will correct you a little bit here, L. Tim. He says the metals only sell off. He doesn't say they can only sell off in that scenario. He's just pointed out that so I'll give you a couple, of, a little bit of nuggets from it again, listeners, in case you missed uh, the show last week. Again, this is from his research report. I encourage you to check it out for yourself. It's called Gold and Silver Options, pointing to a pullback. He talks about the rallies over the last few months. Uh, he also says uh, silver, silver had a 14% correction over the past month and a half, and gold corrected by about 6.5%. Prior to these declines, options markets signaled that a correction might be on the way. Out-of-the-money calls became exceptionally expensive for both gold and silver just before the correction. Again, that's why I encourage you to check out the article because they have great graphs and visuals. You can see it for yourself. He's measuring that 30 delta risk reversal, so 15 delta call, 15 delta put. And he's talking about skewness. What he means by skewness, he's just subtracting the puts from the calls. So the more bid the calls get, the higher that number gets right how how much how juicy 
that skew is. I mean, he points out when that skew gets into the 99th percentile, so super bid, I believe, is a technical term. When it gets to that level, that's when we've seen uh, sell-offs fi- uh, rolling off or, or coming in in the weeks and months uh, thereafter. Yeah, it says when, they, when the skewness has achieved those extreme levels, the gold and silver have underperformed over the next three months. And that appears to be the case right now. So some of this move has already been played out in the marketplace, so maybe a little late to dive in now. But it is a very interesting uh, nugget here. Uh, so with a question here from, what was it? It was from L. Tim. Do I do I buy that? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, Eric's not one <laughs> to exaggerate. Eric, particularly when it comes to metals volatility, that seems to really be Eric's bailiwick. He's made some very great salient points about gold volatility in the past. So I tend to trust him. Not that I don't trust Blue. I trust them both. But I particularly like Eric's reports when it comes to metals volatility and skew. That kind of seems to be where he hangs his hat. So this is an interesting finding. I discussed this with Russell Rose last week. Both of us were hard-pressed to think of Another example of this in the marketplace, so it is very rare. You don't see a lot of things where a particular wing is dramatically bid and then the underlying shoots in the other direction <laughs> like we're seeing here in gold and, and <coughs> silver. But that appears to be the case. So, yeah, I have no reason uh, to doubt this. Eric, Eric's research is usually pretty thorough. I will admit with you that it is surprising, and that's why he wrote about it. It's a surprising finding, and that's kind of what makes it interesting. I think you guys should check it out for yourself. So do I buy it? Yes, I buy it. And uh, have I seen it in other products? I've been looking ever since this research came out. Uh, you certainly don't see this. Sean, can you think off the top of your head? I'm putting you on the spot here. Name right now five products that have exhibited this, this in the past month. Oh, don't throw <laughs> me on that spot. Come on. <laughs> but it is, it is, would you agree? This is a very surprising finding, is it not? It's, uh, uh, it's incredible. Yeah, that's, that statistic is, is uh, r- really interesting. All right, listeners, unfortunately, that music means we've come to the end of the Futures Options feedback. We've also come to the end of this excellent sojourn through the world of Futures Options. Let's see, what do we talk here? Talk some rates, talk some equities, we talk nat gas, talk WTI, we talk metals, we answered, yes, milk, we answered your questions about milk and iron ore. See, people who complain about their product not on the show, Sean, they just weren't listening this week. We touched on just about everything. We are diversified. We are. I think the only thing we missed is ags. I know we got some ag heads out there, so I, I apologize. Oh, in a big way. You're right. I don't we know did. if you recall. We can't, we, this show could be seven hours, Sean, if you <laughs> wanted it to be. The, the feedback we get, how come you didn't focus on this esoteric pro- I wish. I wish we could do them all. Ask, ask for a seven-hour show next time, and maybe we'll see what we can do. So that music, unfortunately, means we've come to the end of our journey. But, Sean, before we go, I know you're running around. You were just at uh, FIA. Hopefully your travel schedule will, will calm down for a little bit, but... What's what's in the near term future for you? And also, if folks want to learn more about what you guys have cooking in the land of Footsie Russell, where should they go? What should they do? S. Smith at FootsieRussell.com. FootsieRussell.com is our website. Um, you can go to our partner exchanges, CMEGroup.com and, and SIBO.com as well, SIBO Global. Um, lots of information there about uh, our products and our, in, our indices as well. Um, the, the the index products have been doing extremely well, as I talked about earlier earlier in the show. Um, personally, I'm going to be around for the next couple of weeks. So uh, if you don't mind, I'll be uh, coming back oh, into the studio. Did I mention I'm on the road for the next three weeks? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, great. I don't know how, the, how that works out. There you uh, go. <laughs> we'll have to arrange uh, some delicious burgers. or, or There's a Gibson's right over there. You don't have to go hit that one over there. But check him out and give him a follow over there on the old Twitter. Is that well? At FTSE Russell. F-T-S-C Russell. Dot com. It's also a place to go for all that data you guys are always asking about, about the buy rights and the premium harvesting and all those strategies. They got the data over there. Go check it out, FootsieRussell.com. And, of course, you can always check out this show and all the reports, all the cool stuff that we do, cmegroup.com slash TWIO or TWIO, T-W-I-O. They both work. While you're there, check out that report by Eric from yourself. Judge for yourself whether you buy it or not. It's not for me to say whether you should buy it. I think you guys should read it for yourselves and make your own conclusion. I don't know what to intuit from uh, what was the name here, Lily Enthal's uh, Question. I, I'm not guessing. I'm guessing from his question, he doesn't buy it. But I think it's an interesting bit of. Oh, it was L. Tim. I'm sorry, L. Tim didn't buy it. So maybe you don't. But interesting stuff to read, nonetheless. Simigroup.com slash twifo. Begin your journey. And on behalf of Sean and our friends over there at CME, and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in such great questions. We can do a whole question show. Maybe we will one of these days. Then you can't blame us if we don't touch on your product because you guys didn't write in about it. So it's, it's up to you. If you want a question, if you want a product, if you want something obscure on the show, let us know. We'd like to hear from you. Or send it to Sean. 
That's Smith and Footsie Russell, who may be forwarded to me, and you can bother him in the interim. And we'll see you back here tomorrow at 1 p.m. Central for Volatility Views, and we kick it all off again on Monday with Option Block, and we're back here on Thursday for more of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by QuickStrike, options pricing and analysis software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X. Com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 futures and options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.